minds as we uh, before we receive God's word, let us pray the prayer for illumination together. Gracious, Gracious God, God, give, give us, us humble, humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that, that we, we may receive what, what you have revealed, revealed and, do and do what you have commanded us. Amen. Amen. I'll hand this time over to Pastor Ben. Thank you, Kwan Loy, in leading us in a time of worship. And now we enter into a time of worship in our service by looking at God's Word. So, good morning, church. Morning indeed. Today, we begin on a new sermon series on Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is uh, probably the shortest man in the Bible because he is Nehemiah. But I've been told recently that there is in Job chapter 2, verse 11, a man named Bildad, who is not an Israelite, not an Ammonite, but a Shuhite. So maybe Bildad is even shorter. Just kidding. But when we think about the book of Nehemiah, we think of the broken walls of Jerusalem, isn't it? That's a, always the thing that we will remember when we think about Nehemiah. The broken walls of Jerusalem and the rebuilding of these broken walls. Bishop Solomon, in his book on Nehemiah, writes of how even though these are physical walls that Nehemiah is repairing, these broken walls, in a sense, has a spiritual dimension to it as well. And they can represent the broken lives of persons who are in need of repair and restoration as well. And I think with the pandemic, I've been hearing about broken relationships and tattered careers, struggles to put things back together again as it once was. And sometimes it is easier, isn't it, to give in and to give up trying to repair these broken walls. Walls and broken lives. They remind me of an old nursery rhyme that I've not heard for quite a while now. And of course, you would know this nursery rhyme. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again, right? It can sometimes seem as if these broken walls in our lives can never be repaired. It is too difficult. It is too daunting. Like Humpty Dumpty having fallen off the wall. But if we will see from the book of Nehemiah, what we'll see is true that even if the work of rebuilding walls can seem as if it's so difficult, so massive, and even if opposition and discouragement can come, but if individuals and communities will submit ourselves to God and persevere on, then these walls can be rebuilt. Lives can be restored. And there is hope for us. And we can press on. And so that is the overall theme that we are exploring in the sermon series on Nehemiah. How as individuals and as communities, we can submit ourselves to God. That God can rebuild and restore the broken walls of our lives. That God can rebuild and restore the broken walls of our lives. If there's any broken walls in your lives, you need to listen to this sermon series. Because God can rebuild and restore the broken walls in our lives. There will be two parts to this sermon series. The first part looks at the servants, look at Nehemiah's qualities and actions, what he did to rebuild these walls. And the second part, from chapter 8 onwards, we will then look at the community's response. What the community did, what are the community's qualities and actions, even as they submitted to God to rebuild those walls. The titles of the sermons generally follow that of the commentary written by this Old Testament scholar, uh, Raymond Brown. and He wrote a commentary on Nehemiah and we are largely following his titles uh, of the book of the various chapters of Nehemiah. Today, we are looking at a servant's preparation. And we'll be looking at the verses in Nehemiah chapter 1 in two segments. Firstly, in verses 1 to 3, what does Nehemiah need to prepare for? Why does he need to prepare? What was he preparing for? And then we'll be using these three verses to look at the background and the context of Nehemiah. And then we'll look at the rest of the chapter, 
verses 4 to 11 onwards to see how then Nehemiah prepares for the work that he's going to do. So let's look at Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 first. Verses 1 to 3 are entitled, Report from Jerusalem in the English Standard Version. Let me read it for us. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chileth, in the 20th year as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. In verse 1, we catch immediately the context of where Nehemiah was and what his implications are already. We read that Nehemiah was in Susa. Susa is the winter capital of the Persian Empire, which was the most powerful empire in the ancient world during Nehemiah's time, the Persian Empire. There have been other big empires in the past before that. For example, after King David's kingdom had been divided into two, the northern kingdom Israel and the southern kingdom Judah, it was the Assyrian Empire who was the big player at the time. In 722 BC, because of the sinfulness of the Israelites, God had allowed the Assyrian Empire to conquer the northern kingdom Israel and the majority of the population were deported all over the Assyrian Empire. About 150 years later, in 586 BC, the Babylonian Empire now had risen to take over the Assyrian Empire. They sacked Judah and its capital, Jerusalem. And the Jerusalem temple was destroyed, the walls were torn down, the leaders of the land were exiled, were deported to Babylon. And in Babylon, these brightest minds, the brightest Jewish minds, ended up serving in the Babylonian courts, like Daniel and his three friends. And now, like Nehemiah himself, a few generations later, a Jew now serving in the courts of a foreign empire. Nehemiah was now serving the Persian Empire, the latest big empire, biggest empire of the ancient world. The Persian Empire had risen out of the weakness of the Babylonians, and the Persian king, King Cyrus, began to allow the Jews, like Zerubbabel, to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. The temple was finally rebuilt uh, in 516 BC, and even though there had been some opposition along the way, but it was finally rebuilt in 516 BC. And then Ezra would arrive in Jerusalem in, five, in 458 BC, and he established a community who would strive to live according to God's word, as we read from the book of Ezra in the Old Testament. And then Nehemiah came along and got involved in the work in Jerusalem. It is in this context that when Hanina, Hanani <laughs> returns to Jerusalem from, uh, Jeru returns to Susa from Jerusalem, that we read of Nehemiah asking them about Jerusalem. What's happening there? Nehemiah had asked. And the news that Hanani brought was not good news. Because they said, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. Even though they had now gone back to our homeland, even though they had now gone back to the promised land, but they are living in great trouble and shame. The walls of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed, which means they have no safety. Enemies can come anytime. They can breach the walls of Jerusalem anytime to come into the city. So that was the problem facing Nehemiah. You can tell that Nehemiah was very concerned about the state of affairs in Jerusalem because as soon as Hanani arrived, the very first question that Nehemiah asked was, what's happening in Jerusalem? And we read immediately in the next verse, in verse 4, that Nehemiah grieved and wept and mourned for days when he heard the news. He wrote, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Nehemiah was greatly burdened 
by what was happening in Jerusalem. And sometimes, God places His call upon people's lives by placing a burden upon their hearts. And it was so for Nehemiah. He wept and moaned for days with this great burden in his heart. Now, church, I want you to notice a crucial thing. And that's the main point of the sermon today. Nehemiah, in his position of influence and power, he was the cupbearer to the king, the great king of Persia. He could have easily, immediately got up and began planning, right, on how to solve this burden in his heart. He could have begun immediately to strategize on how to get the necessary resources, to send the right people, to mobilize others who are also burdened for Jerusalem, to immediately get to work and go back to Jerusalem and to repair those walls. But I want us to notice what he did first. Instead of getting straight up into action, we read here in verse 4 that he sat down. Instead of getting up, he sat down. He sat down and he wept and he moaned for days. He fasted and he prayed. He prayed. He prayed before he planned. He prayed before he planned. And that's the main point of the sermon today. We need to pray before we plan. And that's a good biblical principle. To help us to remember this, I've come up with a new word. And the new word is preparation. Preparation. The best preparation we can ever make to resolve any burdens, to solve any issues, is to make preparations. To pray before we plan. To pray before we plan. Because ultimately, we don't want to end up solving the problems with our own wisdom, with our own smarts. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 25 tells us that the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5, it reminds us that our faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, our own wisdom, or other people's wisdom, but in the power of God. So we want to ask God. We want to ask God what God's plans are in how the burden should be resolved, in how the problem can be solved. We don't want to solve things in our own way, but we want to solve it in God's way, the best way. A.W. Tozer, someone who is well known for being fervent in prayer and writing on prayer, he wrote, with the goodness of God to desire our highest welfare, because he loves us so much, the wisdom of God to plan it, and the power of God to achieve it, what do we lack? Surely we are the most favoured of all creatures. So let's seek God. Don't jump straight into planning, but let's begin with prayer. Ask God to reveal His plans before planning. Pray before planning. Make preparations. But how did Nehemiah pray before he started planning? How did Nehemiah make his preparations? Well, let's now read from the rest of the chapter, the chapter in chapter 1, verses 5 to 11. And this is what he wrote. And I said, he prayed, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. We have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you have commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. And that's what happened to the Israelites. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the outermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. 
They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your great hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servants, to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was a cupbearer to the king. So how did Nehemiah pray before he planned? How did Nehemiah make preparations? Nehemiah looked up, looked in, and looked forward. Nehemiah looked up, looked in, and looked forward. Let me explain. Nehemiah looked up. He looked up to God. He looked up to the person of God and the promises of God. Let me say that again. Nehemiah looked up. He looked up to the person of God and the promises of God. In verse 5, Nehemiah looked up to the person of God. He wrote, he prayed, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. These words are similar to the words that Moses uttered centuries ago. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, Moses was encouraging the Israelites to trust in God who will surely establish them in the promised land. Moses had said, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments. You see the similarity in the words being used? Covenant, steadfast love, those who love Him and keep His commandments. Now Nehemiah was looking up to the same God who has been faithful to the Israelites all these generations. He's looking up to God to once again establish His people back in the promised land. Just as Moses had beseeched God to establish His people in the promised land, now Nehemiah does the same, looking up to the same God who is a faithful God. But Nehemiah not only looked up to the person of God who is faithful, he also looked up to the promises of God. In verses 8 and 9, in his preparation, Nehemiah prayed, Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying that if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you amongst the people. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the outermost parts of heaven, from there, Nehemiah was remembering the promise of God, you have said, Lord, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place I have chosen and make my name dwell there. Remember the word, O Lord. Remember what you said, O Lord. You have promised that you will gather your people and bring them to the place you have chosen to make your name dwell there. Nehemiah is claiming upon the promise of God. He's saying to God, God, do it again, Lord. Do it again. You have promised, do it again, Lord. Nehemiah looked up to the person of God and the promises of God. Now it is here that I do have a small worry for our generation. Nehemiah could look up to the person of God, to the promises of God, because Nehemiah knew God intimately. Clearly, he knew the words of Moses found in the Torah, to be able to look up correctly to the person of God and to the promises of God requires us to know the Word of God, to know God's Word. Unfortunately, in our generation, recent research has shown that Bible literacy is falling. It's ironic, right? That even though in our generation, you know, we, more than ever before, we can easily read and listen to God's Word. We have, it in the, we have it in our handphones. It's with us day and night, all day long. We can not only read it, we can listen to it as well. But we actually know less of the Bible. We actually know less of the kind of person that God is. We actually know less of His promises in the Bible. Because Bible literacy has been falling. We have not been reading God's Word in our generation then how are we going to be able to confidently make preparations to look up to the person of God and to claim His promises for our lives if we do not know God and we do not know His promises? 
And that's why as a church, we've been encouraging one another, right? To read God's Word. To follow the encounter journal in reading God's Word. One promise that we can remember from yesterday's encounter journal is from James chapter 4, verse 8. That is when we draw near to God, God will draw near to us. So church, let's draw near to God by reading His Word to know Him and to know His promises and He will draw near to us. Let us strive to read God's Word so that in our preparations, as we look up to God, we can look up to both His person and His promises. But Nehemiah not only looked up, he looked in as well. He looked into his own heart and he confessed his sins before God. He looked into his own heart and he confessed his sins before God. In verse 6, Nehemiah prayed, Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of a servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. Nehemiah prayed. Not only did Nehemiah confess the sin of his people, the Israelites, he identified with the sin. He looked into his own heart and he confessed that even he and his father's house, they have sinned. He realized he was not sinless, he was sinful. And he confessed that he had sinned as his father's house had sinned. How, has, how did Nehemiah sin though? We, I mean, we certainly do not read of any obvious sin that he has committed. Or what is known as the sins of uh, commission, something that we do, something that we commit, sins that we commit, sin that one actively participates in and commits. We don't read of that in Nehemiah. But what is likely is that Nehemiah is identifying, he's identifying himself with sins of omission, sins of omission, things that he ought to have done but he did not do. In verse 7, we possibly catch a glimpse of that. Nehemiah prayed in verse 7, we have acted very corruptly against you and we have not kept the commandments, the statutes and the rules that you have commanded your servant Moses. So maybe Nehemiah was identifying with the commands to perhaps care for the poor, to provide for the homeless, and he realised that these are commandments that he has not been following actively. He has omitted them. He has not cared for the poor as much as he could have done. He has not provided for the homeless as much as he could have done. He has sinned the sin of omission. It is something that is similar to what we pray in our Holy Communion ritual as well, in the prayer of confession. We pray regularly on the first Sunday of every month. We have not loved our neighbours and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Ultimately, looking in, Nehemiah recognised that he is a sinful creature. And we too ought to recognise that as the Apostle John puts it in 1 John 1.8, that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Because the truth is all we like sheep have gone astray. Some of us have committed sins of commission, but some of us have committed sins of omission. We have not done what we ought to do. Someone once said that the easiest way for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. Many of us perhaps have committed the sins of omission. If we, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. When we look in, we recognise that we are sinful and we are in need of God's forgiveness and God's help. We are able to say more fully that whatever we plan, whatever we think of will be marred by sin, will be tainted with sin. And that is why we need God's plan. We need God to reveal His plans for how He wants to resolve the problem, for how He wants to solve the issue. When we pray before we plan in our preparations, we look up to the person of God and promises of God, we are saying that God can. And when we look in to our hearts and confess our sins, we are saying that we can't. God can, but we can't. That's why we need to look to God for His plans. And that sets us 
up well for how we can then look forward. Nehemiah looked up, he looked in, and he looked forward. Nehemiah confidently declares and seeks God's way forward in now verses 10 and 11. He prays, These are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. And now give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Nehemiah declares confidence in who God's people are to God, a people who have been redeemed uh, by God, by his own great power and his own strong hand. And now by declaring himself as a servant, he's saying that I'm a servant, God. You are my master. Nehemiah is saying that I want to do your will. You are my master. I'm your servant. And that again is an important point. Nehemiah sees himself as the servant and God as the master. Nehemiah's job is to accomplish God's will and not his own will. He is not the master. God is. What about us, though, in our prayers? Many a times when we pray, we want our own wills to be accomplished, isn't it? We want God to answer our prayers the way we want our prayers to be answered. Ultimately, if we do so, we want to be the master ourselves. We are saying that, God, you are our servant, you do our will. We want to be master, and God, you are the servant. But Nehemiah reminds us that if we truly trust in the person of God and the promises of God, and know that we are sinful people, and our own plans are likely going to be tainted by sin, then we have to let God be the master. And we pray the prayer of servants not of masters, and servants do the will of the master. We are servants who are praying before planning, servants making preparations, looking to God as the master, looking in as sinful servants, and looking forward to accomplish God's will in God's way, not our way. Let me say that again. We are servants who are praying before planning, Servants making preparations, looking up to God as our master, looking in as sinful creatures, and looking forward to accomplish God's will. God's way, not our way. And as Nehemiah made his preparation, looking up, looking in, and looking forward, we begin to catch a glimpse of the plan that God has revealed to him through all these days of preparations. Nehemiah had been fasting, he had been praying for days, and now he closes off his prayer with these words in the second part of verse 11. He says, he prays to God, Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Who is, who is this man? Well, Nehemiah goes on to allude to it. He says in the next part of the verse, now I was the cupbearer to the king. This man was the king, the king of Persia. And the plan has got something to do with this king, something to do with him being the cupbearer to the king. What is this plan? Well, that's for next Sunday. <laughs> Come next Sunday to listen to Pastor Tsuhui and you will know what God's plan is that God has revealed to Nehemiah. But for this week, in closing, let us remember to pray before we plan. To pray before planning. In our preparation, we look up, we look in, and we look forward. In all your burdens, in the broken walls of your lives, pray before planning. Let's pray together. As I was making my own preparations for this sermon, I was praying for today, I began to have this impression in my heart that some of us 
gathered in this service and the service later. That we are facing broken walls in our lives. Perhaps you have already tried a few things in how in, repair, in trying to repair these broken walls, but have found it to be unfruitful, unable to accomplish what you hope can be accomplished in repairing these walls. The reminder for us today is to come to the Lord first, to seek God's plan, to seek God's will, to go back to praying before planning. So won't you come to the Lord today in the quietness of your hearts, perhaps take this afternoon, take this evening, to just pray. Ask God, God, I'm your servant. Lord, won't you accomplish your will? Reveal yourself to me in this broken walls of my life. I want to do what you know is best, O oh Lord. Won't you guide me and lead me? Help me to be a servant to you today so that, Lord, your will may be accomplished. So, Lord, we ask for those of us who are facing broken walls in our lives, we pray that you reveal yourself and your plans through your Holy Spirit to us. Help us to look up to you, to your person and to your promises. Help us look inward if there's any areas in our lives we need to make right because we have, been, we have sinned against you and perhaps our fellow human beings. Help us to look then forward to what you will reveal to us so that, Lord, as servants, we may walk in your ways and not our own ways. And so, Lord, we thank you that we can look to you for guidance in all these broken walls in our lives and trust that you can rebuild and you can restore these broken walls of our lives. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.